farms. I've been with them for about three years or so. I do run the uh, strip till machine quite a bit myself. And um, we are also a corn and soybean seed dealership. We sell quality seeds. We do soil testing and analysis as well as well as working with Climate Field View and do custom farming. So we have, it's a busy workplace that we have, but it's, it's a, an exciting environment. So for Valdale, we farm just southeast of Woodstock here. The land is quite a bit different than right here in this area. Um, it's quite a bit heavier, it's more rolling. So we have sand and clay, and it's um, pretty heavy stuff. So they used to be full tillage, uh, using a moldboard plow for pretty much corn, bean stubble, all of that. So all the land would be bare in the spring. They found that it was very time consuming and also very expensive plowing all those acres as well as trying to find skilled operators for, for plowing was having a toll. Also thinking about um, more efficient use of fertilizer that seemed like a, a good way to go um, putting those nutrients right where the crop is and also the ability to variable rate the fertilizer right in that band and also I like the way that it integrates well with cover crops it's a system where you can have your cover crop growing in the field you can still till that berm have a nice clean berm in the spring but you don't have to worry about the cover crop matting um, over where you want to plant your seed. So we found that that's working quite well for us. So we started back in 2014. They brought a, a 12 row soil warrior, the yellow one that's out at the, the demo plot out there. We needed a unit that's heavy enough to penetrate those heavy clay soils. Um, the discussion over a coulter or a shank was one that they talked about and it seems with using a shank on that type of soil we were very worried about sidewall compaction and smearing especially in the fall working with wetter soils so we like the idea of a, a coulter system for that so the solar has has two coulters it's got the the single deep tillage coulter for the fall and then we switch to a double wavy coulter in the springtime. Also the ability to have the dry fertilizer right on board made the soil wear a good option as well. It can also variable rate two products at the same time and it can hold up to 16,000 pounds of fertilizer in a fill so you can get quite a bit done with that. We invested in RTK guidance. We felt it was very important especially with our rolling land. It was quite expensive to go to that but um, very worthwhile. We also put implement guidance on both uh, the soil warrior and the corn planter because of the corn planter is a 24 row, the soil warrior is a 12 row. So we're always on that guest row, so we need to make sure that that, well, that equipment stays on the berm as well as possible. So they started that first fall putting down uh, potash. So some of the the early problems that we had was um, the metering rolls, keeping an, an eye on them. Um, plugging can be an issue, as you mentioned, you figured out a way to make it flow better. Headlands can also be a challenge. We don't have a lot of straight rectangular fields. We have a lot of waterways and curves and that kind of thing. So having headlands is, makes it more difficult to keep the planter on the berm. So we're trying to keep the headlands as straight as possible, as much as possible. Also, <clears throat> residue management is important. We do run a chopping corn head. Um, and then our first soil warrior did not have the row cleaners on it, so we switched to one that did, and that made a big difference with how much trash was ending up in the berm. We were finding in the springtime that we could dig up seeds that were wrapped in a leaf of corn or something like that so this, the seed to soil contact was not perfect and that's much improved now that we have uh, the trash whippers on there. Patience is a big one with, um, with our land. If you go on it too soon you end up with bricks and a lot of compaction 
So we need to, my boss is very patient sometimes to the point of we're chomping at the bit to go, but you know, we got to give it a bit more time. So it's, we feel it's very important to wait till that field is fit and we see our neighbors out cultivating probably a day or two before we get out there on a, on a normal year. I would say this spring, with it being wetter, we were probably out there as soon as they were. And we found that having that 20 inches where the tractor was driving in between the berms, nobody was driving on any of the berms, no tire tracks, no compaction. We felt we could be out there a little bit sooner. And judging by the way the corn looks now, it did a very, very good job. We were very happy with, with how that corn came up pretty even. Keeping the sprayer off the berms, very important as well. I can see where the tire tracks are when the sprayer drives on that berm, especially if it's been planted already. It really uh, hurts the yield. And also weed control is something you have. It's the spectrum switches to a little bit more perennial um, pressure, sow thistle and that kind of thing become more of an issue with uh, using less tillage. So the way we're doing things today, we try to follow the combine as much as we can in the fall. Drier is better with, with any piece of tillage equipment, but I would say especially with strip tillage. Um, we like to plant a cover crop, drill in a cover crop after wheat, so sometimes that'll get pretty big. So we try to get in there as soon as, it, or before it gets too big, that we can still make a nice berm. We are variable rating a lot of our potash and phosphorus. So we do we tend to do just straight potash in the fall. And then in the spring we refresh our berms and we put down a 50-50 blend of MAP and MES in the one tank. And I put straight urea in the second tank. And that that way I can variable rate the phosphorus and flatline the uh, urea. It's our fertility program, it's all going up front dry. We don't have any liquid on the planter. And then we come back in with wide drops on the sprayer when the corn is four to five feet tall. And we are also doing some variable rate nitrogen at that time using satellite imagery from FieldView. We've also started moving into the edible bean market a little bit. Last year was our first year doing azuki beans and we're also doing some white beans as well. And the soybeans, we are no-tilling in between those corn stalks. So we moved to a, a twin row um, no-till soybean system as well. So that's a picture of the machine that's working in sod. That's probably where it has the most problems. Um, we were growing our white beans after doing first cut hay and we've moved away from this. We tried it two years in a row and results were not that great. First of all, we were having trouble getting a nice berm there. I think a shank might work better in a sod field like that. And also we were having issues with grubs uh, eating the white beans. So we've, we've gone away from, from that. But there you can see sort of the way the soil is mixing right ahead of the containment disc. So the fertilizer, it's not put in a, in a band it's mixed throughout the profile of the whole berm. So as the soil's mixing, it's blowing the fertilizer into that. And you can find fertilizer. There's some on the surface and there's some down deeper as well. So there's a picture of a fall pass into, that would have been wheat stubble with a multi-species cover crop mix. You can see the, the way the soil looks there, nice and crumbly. And that, that is a heavy clay farm and that soil is, is looking completely different after five years of, of strip tillage and cover crops. Just another picture of a berm. You can see the radish there in the corner. Same field, another picture. Just notice the amount of, the amount of cover crop between the rows that stays there um, for the winter. It's really helping with our erosion. The, with that heavy clay, the water tends to move across the surface quite a bit and this really is helping hold the soil in one spot. It's uh, October the 17th, picture of the turnip and on the right hand side is in December. That cover crop is still growing a little bit.
Also, December 5th, you can see that I generally mix oats and rye, almost an equal amount. I want the oats to winter till. I want the rye to overwinter into the spring. So having it as a half and half mix, it allows the, in the springtime, it's not too thick that the sunlight can't penetrate and, and dry up the soil, warm it up. Another picture in the winter, you can see the way it's holding the snow. And then that's in the springtime, same field. That's the, the rye that is um, regrowing. You can see on the left, we, or on your right-hand side, we sprayed that field ahead of corn. Um, and then on June the 25th, that's how the corn looks as it's coming up. But notice how, the, how much residue is left between those rows. It disappears so quickly. It doesn't matter how much you start with. The biology is just eating it up very quickly. That's a fall picture, stripping into soybean stubble with no cover crop. Strip tilling through uh, winter rye that was seeded after soybeans. We used the air seeder, actually drilled that rye in, and then we strip tilled it. And that's how it looked later in the fall, the rye growing through the winter. And then into the spring, you can see the rye again, there's uh, close to a foot tall, as well as we started looking at our spring pass. And that's how the, the berm looked on that field in that year. Working up, not bad, a little bit clumpy. Since, since that spring, we've switched to having the leading coulter ahead of the two wavy coulters. And we've been really happy with that switch. It seems to, to make the seed bed even a little bit finer. Um, if it's too lumpy, we work it twice. But this spring, with that leading coulter, we ended up working the fields twice very little. And that's that same field with the corn crop. Again, you see the way the rye just disappears um, between those corn rows. That's a picture of the Yuzuki beans planted on June the 2nd, just coming up. We weren't sure what to expect uh, growing the white beans. So we're not doing, or the Yuzukis, we're not doing any cultivation between the rows. Um, we basically just strip tilled it fall, strip tilled it spring, planted them, and that's what they looked like in September. We ended up doing well enough on them that we're growing them again this year. So they ended up yielding very well for us. We were a little bit worried about having that um, corn stalks in between and then having your header, maybe not being able to dip into the pockets, but we found that 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 wasn't an issue. The field, after you plant it, becomes very level again, even with the, the berm, the plant, planter just flattens it. We roll the field to roll down the corn stalks, and we, we had no issues with combining it. So that was one worry that we had that we didn't see an issue with it at all. And that's a picture of the, the unit that we run right there. Thank you.